Coming up on our newscast, the Korean government announces a de facto end to MERS as no new cases were confirmed for 23 straight days and zero patients in quarantine. North Korea's ambassador to China defends Pyongyang's nuclear program as a necessity to protect itself from Washington and Seoul's hostilities, demanding the world to stop comparing the communist state to Iran. China's stock market continues to fall, striking fear in investors around the world. Korea's Financial Services Commission vows to stay vigilant and look out for possible effects the Chinese slump could have on the Korean economy. All next on Primetime News. Hello and welcome to Primetime News on this Tuesday, July 28th. I'm Daniel Che. And I'm Hwang Jie. Thanks for joining us. Well, it's been almost 10 weeks since the first case of Millis Respiratory Syndrome or MERS was reported here in Korea. And today the government has declared the de facto end to the outbreak. Officials say we can breathe a little easier now. Our Han Daen starts us off. All 15 hospitals affected by the MERS outbreak have been released from special watch. On top of this, no new cases have been confirmed for 23 straight days, and the number of people in quarantine is zero. Given the circumstances, the government and the medical world believe our citizens can relax. The virus no longer poses a threat. The battle is virtually over. Prime Minister Hwang kyo on Tuesday announced a de facto end to the MERS outbreak that claimed 36 lives and infected 186 people in Korea. The declaration comes 69 days since the first case was confirmed on May 20th. The prime minister encouraged the public to continue on with their daily lives without the slightest concern about MERS. Hwang added that he hoped to see citizens fully re-engage in the various economic, cultural and educational activities they were involved in before the outbreak. Apologizing for the government's poor handling of the crisis in the early stages, the prime minister pledged to examine the reasons why to learn from the mistakes that were made. I will find out what went wrong with the initial response to the outbreak and take all the necessary follow-up measures. The prime minister vowed to uphold the elevated watch level at medical facilities until the outbreak is declared officially over. 11 of the 12 remaining MERS patients still in hospital have tested negative, but one patient has shown mixed results and is set to undergo further testing this week. The official end to the outbreak is expected to come at the end of next month, as the World Health Organization suggests a 28-day wait-and-see period after the final MERS patient tests negative. Han Dan, Ajang News. And Seoul's foreign ministry says seven countries have lifted their travel advisories for Korea on Tuesday. Those countries include China, the Czech Republic, Russia, Taiwan, the United Arab Emirates, Mongolia and Vietnam. Plus, Hong Kong is also expected to lift its travel warning against non-essential trips to Korea in the near future. A special parliamentary committee tasked with handling the MERS outbreak has requested an inspection of Samsung Medical Center one of the epicenters of the virus. The committee in resolution on Tuesday urged the government to scrutinize the steps the hospital took in treating MERS patients as well as take stock of its own poor handling of the outbreak. The center was the source of infection for 91 patients, about half of the total. The resolution is expected to pass the full assembly next month. With that, the MERS committee, composed of 18 lawmakers from both parties, wrapped up its 48 days of parliamentary activity. Now shifting gears, in the wake of an international deal on Iran's nuclear program, countries participating in multinational efforts to denuclearize North Korea have expressed hopes for a similar resolution. But Pyongyang dashed those hopes earlier today, referring to itself as a nuclear weapons state. Our Choi Yusan reports. At a press conference for foreign journalists, a North Korean ambassador to China, Xi Jae-ryong, made it clear his country will not return to multilateral negotiations on its nuclear weapons program. We do not have any interest at all in dialogue on unilaterally freezing or giving up our nukes. 
The so-called six-party talks to curb the North's nuclear ambitions involving the two Koreas, the U.S., China, Japan and Russia, have been stalled since early 2009. In the wake of the deal struck by the U.S. and five world powers on curbing Iran's nuclear program, the six-party nations have been seeking a similar agreement with the North. Pyongyang, however, sees things differently. The situation of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is totally different from Iran. We are a nuclear state, both in name and reality. The North Korean diplomat defended Pyongyang's nuclear deterrent as a means of protecting itself from Washington's hostile policies. He also criticized the U.S. and South Korea for their annual military drills, saying the exercises are part of Washington's plan to bolster its so-called pivot to Asia policy by maintaining tensions between the two Koreas. While an official in Seoul has suggested North Korea may be trying to mislead its longtime ally China about its nuclear intentions, South Korea's top nuclear negotiator, who visited China recently, warned the North of the consequences it would have to face if it doesn't change its current course. Stressing the international community will respond firmly to the North's provocations, the envoy said the regime is at a crossroads between completion of its nuclear arms development and denuclearization through dialogue. Che Yusan, Arirang News. So where do we go from here after North Korea's adamant stance on staying nuclear? Well, According to Professor Charles Armstrong at Columbia University, Washington should take a different type of negotiation from the past with Pyongyang to gently inch closer to denuclearizing the regime. Our Hwang Sung-hee sat down with him in New York. Do you think the latest uh, nuclear deal with Iran could provide an opportunity for uh, North Korea to rethink about re-engaging with Washington? Well, North Korea is the only one of these three left that Obama talked about at the beginning of his administration. He's opened up the door to Cuba. We now have a, a, a deal with Iran to halt its nuclear program. And it would be a fantastic opportunity for President Obama to leave as his legacy uh, an improved relationship with North Korea. North Korea is far more advanced than Iran was. Uh, and it has stated repeatedly that it does, does not wish to and will not negotiate away its nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean that the denuclearization of North Korea is impossible, but it will take a different kind of negotiation than ha has been done between Washington and Pyongyang in the past. What crucial steps should both Washington and Pyongyang take? One could imagine uh, a deal in which both sides agree on the ultimate denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula as a long-term goal. But in the meantime, as negotiations are underway, that North Korea would freeze its nuclear program. I think we have to start with that point now. It's too late to go back to the older position of simply telling North Korea it has to give up its nuclear program right away. That's not going to happen. There are, are reports of mid-ranking North Korean officials defecting uh, because of Kim Jong-un's fear, so-called fear politique, mm -hmm. is this a sign of instability? It reminds me of his grandfather's purges in the late 1950s, uh, which also terrified uh, many of the people surrounding Kim Il-sung. Uh, and a lot of those went into exile into to China, to Russia, and so on. But this did not lead in the 1950s, as we know, to the collapse of the regime. So this, in fact, can be Kim Jong-un's way of consolidating his power, um, but uh, it also has negative potential outcomes as well. So we'll have to see where this goes. President Park Geun-hye has been pushing for the so-called trust-building process with North Korea. Do you think that maybe there's a need for a new approach? I think that at this point, uh, bold steps are necessary. I think we've been waiting a, a long time for a breakthrough. This hasn't happened. Uh, and perhaps it's time to do something more dramatic, to really reach out in a very significant way and to have uh, a summit meeting, to have a, a very high level set of talks and to really get the diplomacy between Pyongyang and Seoul back on track. It's been a very slow uh, and difficult 
time for the last five years on the Korean Peninsula, so I think that uh, perhaps a new approach is necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully the 70th anniversary of liberation will be that opportunity. Thank you, Professor, for your time today. Thank you. We're keeping our sights fixated on North Korea. Recent comments made by U.S. intelligence officials are landing weight to speculations that the Hermit Kingdom's forces could carry out provocative action this fall, as the regime usually displays its military might during an important anniversary. Our Connie Kim has the details. The U.S. is expecting North Korea to launch a military provocation in October to coincide with the anniversary of the founding of its ruling Workers' Party. The prediction was made by a U.S. intelligence official on Monday who met with South Korea's ruling Saenuri Party chairman Kim Musang, according to the party spokesman. The spokesman didn't identify the U.S. official by name. The official reportedly didn't say what kind of provocation is expected. The official was also said to have made note of the North's recent claim that it conducted a successful underwater test of a submarine-launched ballistic missile. In addition, the official was said to have doubts about Pyongyang's stated two-track policy of nuclear and economic development, saying the regime does not appear to be working toward developing its economy. The Senuri chairman, in an address in Washington on Monday, called for cooperation between Seoul and Washington to entice Pyongyang to give up on its nuclear and missile development. Kim called for an alternative approach to the issue similar to the way the U.S. used various tactics to bring about the recent nuclear deal with Iran and restore diplomatic ties with Cuba. He also expressed concern that domestic events in the North could influence Pyongyang's decision to carry out a provocation. And adding to the ongoing concerns, North Korea has recently completed an upgrade of the launch pad that propelled the rocket the regime launched three years ago. Military sources in South Korea say the regime could use it to fire a long-range missile twice the size of the rocket around the time of the Workers' Party anniversary in October. Connie Kim, Arirang News. In other news, South Korea's ruling Senuri Party chairman called for a sincere apology in a statement set to be announced by Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe next month. Speaking to U.S. officials and congressmen on Monday, Party Chief Kim Musang said it will be unacceptable for Japan to release a backtracking statement marking the 70th anniversary of the end of the World War II. Kim emphasized Abe's sincere apologies of its past atrocities is a, mess, is a must rather for a forward-looking future and asked U.S. officials to persuade Abe in doing so. Kim also highlighted the need for Japan's sincere apologies during his meeting with Senator John McCain the same day. The board of directors of Japan-based Lotte Holdings Corporation voted to can Lotte Group's founder Shin kyuk from his post of chief executive and general chairman and named him instead honorary chairman of Lotte Holdings on Tuesday. Now this puts Shin's second son Dongbin at the helm of the retail giant. The move comes amid a power struggle between Shin's two sons Dongju and Dongbin. Lotte Group stressed that the removal of the founder from his post will not affect the group's Korean business, adding that Shin will continue to supervise agendas in Korea. Lotte is Korea's fifth largest conglomerate and started off as a confectionery in Japan in 1948. In the face of sluggish exports, Korea's top business groups saw their operating profits plunge last year, tumbling to a level lower than during the global financial crisis in 2008. Our Kim ji reports. Korea's top 30 business groups saw their profitability tumble in 2014, mainly due to sluggish domestic demand and exports. Their combined operating profit stood at 49.2 billion U.S. dollars last year, a near 35 percent plunge from 2010, according to data compiled by corporate tracker Chebel.com. The business group's combined operating profit last year was even lower than what it was during the global financial crisis in 2008. The group's operating margin, the ratio of operating income to total revenue, also stood at 4 percent, nearly half of that recorded in 2010. Chebel.com says the groups have enjoyed the fruits of favorable government-led currency exchange policies and stimulus measures effective through 2012. 
Korean companies are currently in a crisis in which they are sandwiched between China and Japan. To overcome the difficulties, they need to maintain their product quality, and a global economy has to recover. But there was some good news for these groups. Last week, Finance Minister Che Gyeon projected Korean exports would improve in the second half to a trade volume of $1 trillion. During the first half of this year, outbound shipments dropped 5 percent from the same period last year to $269 billion. Kim Jeon, Arirang News. Although the Chinese stock market slide had some adverse effects on the Korean market on Tuesday, the benchmark Kospi closed a tad higher than expected. Our Kim Yeonbin has this report. The after effects of China's stock market plunge on Monday has negatively impacted the Korean stock market, with Kospi's and Kostax lows for Tuesday dropping to 2015 and 720, respectively. Experts say both composites were affected by the Shanghai Composite, which fell 8.5 percent on Monday, the largest drop in eight years. China's stock market continued its freefall on Tuesday as investors shrugged off efforts by regulators to calm the markets. The Shanghai Composite closed down 1.7 percent after recovering from a 4 percent drop when the market opened. This slight recovery had a positive effect on Korea's benchmark Kospi, closing 0.29 points higher at 2039. But China's recent economic downfall is affecting countries around the world, fanning investor fears. China's weak stock market is starting to be viewed as Beijing's having a poor economic growth, and this in turn starting to have an impact on the Korean stock market. The worries don't stop there, as foreign investors are also fearing a possible interest hike by the U.S. Federal Open Market Committee, diminishing the will to invest in emerging markets. In order to better deal with the current situation, Korea's Financial Services Commission said early on Tuesday that it will closely monitor the Chinese market and the possible effects it could have on the Korean economy. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. Korea celebrates the 70th anniversary of the nation's independence this year. To mark the occasion, the country celebrates achievements big and small. The scientific and technological advances are in the spotlight and an expo that kicks off today are Song ji -sun takes us there. After Korea declared its independence in 1945, it didn't seem likely that it would be able to get back on its feet even after a hundred years. But now, 70 years later, Korea produces some of the world's top mobile phones, semiconductors and even nuclear reactors, thanks to its rapid economic and technological development. And the government has pledged to keep on supporting science and technology to fulfill the president's vision for a creative Korea. Our economic achievements were made possible through technology. Technologies are advancing at a much faster rate now. And the success of our creative economy drive is only possible through research and development and investing in science. The prime minister made his remarks at an event that kicked off on Tuesday to showcase 70 landmark technologies that highlight Korea's scientific history. From the technologies that have evolved over the past seven decades to future tech projected for the next 30 years, you can get a glimpse of the past, present and future. This is Korea's first automobile, the Pony, made back in the 70s. Today, Korea is the fifth largest automaker in the world. And this is Hubo, the first humanoid robot built by Korean scientists in 2004. At the expo, aspiring scientists can try to control the half a million dollar droid. It's incredible to actually see a robot. I've always wanted to be a robotics engineer, and this experience makes me want to pursue that dream even more. From drones that seem familiar to opportunities to experience virtual reality or assemble a robot, there is much more to see and be inspired by at this event, which runs through Sunday. Song ji Arirang News. And for the top international news headlines, we now turn to our Lee Sanho at the News Center. Today's focus, Gaddafi's son receives a death sentence, President Obama wraps up a visit to Africa, and Bill Cosby's alleged victims appear on a magazine cover. Sanho, let's start in Libya. 
Yes, a Libyan court sentenced the late dictator Muammar Gaddafi's son, Saif al-Islam, over war crimes committed during the 2011 revolution. Gaddafi will be executed by a firing squad with eight other officials, including the former head of intelligence and the former prime minister. Now, this adds to eight other ex-officials who, instead of a death sentence, will be serving a lifetime in jail, while seven others will serve a 12-year sentence. In, in, in an interview with Saif Gaddafi back in 2011, he denounced the international court seeking his arrest as being controlled by NATO countries. They are self-appointed people. So every 10 people can, uh, can gather themselves and in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a room and say, we are a ruling council. It's a joke. This is a joke. It's a Mickey Mouse council. Nobody's with them. In all, more than 30 accomplices of the late leader stood trial, accused of suppressing peaceful protests during the revolution period. Now, Saif Gaddafi is being held by a former rebel militia group, which is refusing to hand him over to the central government. The trial started in April 2014, before fighting between rival factions in Tripoli began, which has produced two governments competing for authority. And turning to Africa, President Obama is wrapping up a historic five-day tour of the continent and has become the first president in the U.S. to address the African Union headquarters on Tuesday. He met with the AU Commission chair, who welcomed him as one of their own. Now, in his speech, Obama covered a number of topics, including the need for Africa to create jobs for the next generation. He also called on African leaders to tackle corruption, uphold demo uh, democratic freedoms, support human rights, and peacefully leave office when their terms expire. That we must uphold the inherent dignity of every human being. Dignity. That basic idea that by virtue of our common humanity, no matter where we come from or what we look like, we are all born equal, touched by the grace of God. He pledged continued U.S. support to fight terrorism in Africa against groups such as Al-Qaeda, the Islamic State, Al-Shabaab, and Boko Haram. Another one of his major themes during this trip has been to involve the African nations in a bigger role in the overall global economy, especially as China has been conducting more trade with Africa than the U.S. And in entertainment news today, the alleged victims of sexual assault by comedian Bill Cosby made it to the cover of New York Magazine. The 35 women are seated in rows in black and white and in chronological order, according to the alleged attacks, while their story entitled Cosby, the Woman, and Unwelcome Sisterhood is featured inside. The actor-comedian faces serious allegations of drugging and sexually assaulting the women decades ago. The new release generated a buzz among residents of New York City. I used to watch him on TV when I was a kid, so it's kind of sad to hear about it. And I know it's on the front of the magazine today. It's crazy how many people, and there's probably more, so it's terrible. <laughs> Though a total of 46 women have come forward publicly to accuse Cosby, 11 other victims did not appear on the magazine cover. The comedian's attorneys have continuously denied the accusations, while Cosby himself has rarely spoken up on the matter. And that does it for your international news at this hour. I'll see you again tomorrow. It was a hot day here in Seoul, but regions near the Gyeongsangdo provinces had an even more oppressive day with highs hovering in the mid-30s under mostly sunny skies. But thankfully, relief is on the way. A final round of monsoon rain will soak most parts of the country, with some western regions expected to get heavy amounts of rain fall along with gusty winds and lightning. And here in Seoul, we'll wake up to a rainy Wednesday, and the rain will gradually weekend by the afternoon, finally letting up by your evening commute, but still you'll need an umbrella before you're heading out.
tomorrow. Now, temperature-wise, it should be cooler than today here in Seoul, only rising up to 27, but still hot and humid down south, with Daegu and Gwangju topping out at 32 and 31, and Busan will top out at 31 tomorrow afternoon. And as for the other regions, the Jinan Jeju Island will see a high of 29 and 32, while Tokdo rises to 32. Now, looking ahead, it shouldn't be as hot as the last couple of days. Mercury should not exceed 30 degrees Celsius for the next five days here in the capital. However, the first work week of August is forecast to be a steamy one. Well, that's all for the weather. Good night. That brings us to the end of our newscast. Thanks for staying with us. Do join us again same time tomorrow. Goodbye for now.